This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Orcas. The weather is growing cold, dear listeners. The days are growing short, and the trees are going from green to gold to bare. Winter is coming. And as the year darkens, so too do our stories. For on the cusp of winter, we celebrate Halloween. And each year at this time, we at the Word of the Week endeavor to find some dark corner of the fantasy pop culture world to wander, flashlight in hand, to see what we can find. And when it comes to horrific evils dwelling in dark dungeons of our favorite fantasy role-playing game, none looms larger than Orcus, the demon prince of the undead. Now, if you've been a long-time fan of Dungeons & Dragons, you've probably at least heard of Orcus. However, if you've only recently started playing D&D, you might not be familiar with him at all. See, Orcus got a lot of play around the 4th edition era of Dungeons & Dragons, but in the most recent 5th edition, he's been pushed out of the spotlight by his mandrel-headed, tentacled brother, Demogorgon. Well, not his literal brother, his thematic brother. You'll understand in a moment, but first let's make sure you know who Orcus actually is. Orcus is one of the biggest arch-villains in all of Dungeons & Dragons dumb. And when we say biggest, we mean that both figuratively and literally. Orcus is 15 feet tall, disgustingly fat and covered in goat-like hair. He's humanoid, but with a ram's head, goat legs, and long tail with a poisonous tip and a pair of bat wings sprouting from his back. Oh yes, he's a monster. And he was introduced back in 1976 in the Eldritch Wizardry supplement to the original Dungeons & Dragons box set by Brian Bloom and Gary Gygax. His magical scepter, made of bone with a human skull for a head, was also introduced as a magical artifact known as the Wand of Orcus. It's that introduction, by the way, in 1976, that created the relationship between Orcus and Demogorgon. See... Eldritch Wizardry added demons to the game. Moreover, it added the concept of demon princes. Now that title had nothing to do with aristocracy or demonic politics. Demons just aren't that organized. They were pure chaotic evil. But among the many demons in the D&D cosmos, there were several that were so immensely powerful, and they held so many other beings, including demons, in their thrall, that they were special. Those were the demon princes. And while Eldritch Wizardry hinted at many demon princes, only two were named, described, and given statistics. Orcus and Demogorgon. Now, Orcus is a pretty classic D&D villain. He's been at the center of numerous modules, he's appeared in various monster manuals, and a lot of lore has been revealed about him. Most notably that he holds undead in thrall, hence his title... But despite the reams and reams of lore that have been written about Orcus, his popularity has ebbed and flowed throughout the history of D&D. He got a lot of play in the first edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, but when the second edition was released, Orcus had been excised with the purge of all demons and devils that we described in our Malabranche episode. He was restored to his throne in a series of adventures for the Planescape setting, though, and he even literally returned from the dead in the Dead Gods series of adventures. When 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons came out, Orcus was gone again, though his return was touted as a major selling point of the 3rd edition Manual of the Plains. But it was the 4th edition of D&D that Orcus arose anew, greater and more powerful than ever before. And unbeknownst to many fans of D&D, the rebirth of Orcus was actually something of a symbol for the entire edition as a whole. Most 4th edition era gamers remember Orcus as the headliner for the 2008 Monster Manual, and as the featured power behind the power in the first series of adventures released for that edition, starting with Keep on the Shadowfell, and culminating with Module E3, Prince of Undeath. 
But what many people don't know is that Orcus was also something of a code name for 4th edition itself. See, as early as 2005, a team of designers at Wizards of the Coast had started spitballing ideas for the 4th edition of Dungeons & Dragons. At that point, 3rd edition was about 5 years old and going strong, but it was also starting to show its warts. And the designers wanted to start thinking about pushing the design envelope. The idea was that nothing was sacred, anything could be reimagined, and a team including James Wyatt, Andy Collins, and Rob Heinsu were told to go and experiment. Don't stick to the safe ideas of D&D. Mix in new ideas. And their team was codenamed Project Orcus. Actually, they were the first of two Project Orcus teams that would work throughout 2006 on the initial designs of Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. So it's only fitting then that Orcus would play so heavily in the initial product releases for Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. And perhaps it's also appropriate given that Wizards of the Coast rejected almost everything about the 4th edition design and tried to recapture the older spirit of the game when they released 5th edition, that Orcus was nowhere to be seen. Instead, featured heavily in the Out of the Abyss adventure and in R.A. Salvatore's homecoming novels, there was Demogorgon, front and center. Of course, Orcus is much much older than 50 years. He wasn't actually born in 1976. Like so many of D&D's most iconic figures, the name and some of the basic concepts were lifted from mythical figures long since past. And interestingly, the original Orcus was something of a transient figure who also got shoved aside by other demons. So let's talk about Roman mythology and Greek mythology and Etruscan mythology. So you had the underworld, right? The world of the dead, pretty standard mythological fare. The Greeks called the underworld Hades, and it was ruled, as you probably know, by the god of the same name, Hades. And you also know that the Romans got a lot of their mythology from ancient Greek mythology, right? And you know they had an underworld too. And it was ruled by a god of the same name as the underworld itself, right? And that name was... You know? If you said Pluto, you're wrong. The correct answer is actually Orcus. But we forgive you. Because that whole thing about the Romans ripping off their mythology from the Greeks and renaming stuff? Yeah, that's not quite how it happened. And it's more complicated than that. But to understand why, you have to understand what Rome it was and where it came from. So let's go back to the Italian peninsula around about 700 BCE and see if we can disentangle this mess. At the time we're talking about, the southern shore of Italy was covered with Greek colonies and outposts. Meanwhile, northern Italy was ruled by a mysterious civilization known as the Etruscans. And Etruscan civilization was pretty similar to Greek civilization. You had a bunch of independent city-states that shared a common language, religion, and culture. The problem is we don't actually know too much about the Etruscan culture. We know they were pretty advanced, though. They had a written alphabet, one that was never fully deciphered, and had a robust trade network. They worked with gold and silver, and they traded with Greeks, Carthaginians, and the Phoenicians. They also had very complex divination and soothsaying traditions. Between the Greek colonies and the Etruscan cities, there was a small tribe of people known as the Latins. And, basically, they lived in one smallish town on a collection of hills. They were nobodies, honestly. According to their own legends, they were the descendants of the citizens of Troy, having fled the destruction of the city during the Trojan War. But mostly, they were outcasts. They were outsiders, and thieves, outlaws, vagabonds, and escaped slaves from the Etruscan and Greek lands all lived among the Latins. The Latins had two things going for them, though. First, their town was in a pretty defensible position, what with being spread across a number of hilltops. Second, it was located smack dab in the middle of the trade route that ran between the Etruscan lands and the Greek colonies. Consequently, their little town grew quite prosperous. And not just in terms of wealth, in terms of ideas, too. The town was named for its first king, by the way. 
According to legend, he was a grandson of a Trojan hero. Romulus and his brother Remus had fled from Troy and had been raised by wolves. And naturally, as befits a pair of wild boys raised by wolves, they decided that they needed to found a city. The two argued over where to build the city and what to call it, and ultimately, they settled it like brother wolves. Romulus killed Remus and said, This is my city, and it's called Rome. Now, in the early days, Rome was ruled by kings. Romulus was the first. And six more kings reigned after Romulus. Because of the cosmopolitan nature of the growing trade town, the kings were each descended from different cultures or tribes. The last three were Etruscans, and each king left his own mark on the growing metropolis, mostly by borrowing ideas heavily from their own home culture. The famous Roman aqueducts, sewers, and the entire military system were all apparently derived from Etruscan ideas. But there were also lots of Greek innovations mixed in, and things were going very well for the city of Rome and her kings, until 509 BCE. The story begins with the son of King Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud. The son, Tarquinius Sextus, is hanging out with some buddies and drinking heavily. Meanwhile, the gang's wives are all at home, and they aren't expecting their husbands to be home for several days. The drunken men have a wager about whose wife is the most virtuous. They agree to go surprise each man's wife in turn to see what the wife is up to when the husband is out. And none of them is very happy to find out they've all lost the bet because each of their wives is engaged in some kind of debauchery. Except for the wife of one guy, Calatinus. Her name was Lucretia. Now Tarquinius Sextus is pretty upset by this whole thing, and naturally he decides to take it out on the one person who didn't actually do anything wrong. He visits Lucretia late one night, threatens to shame her, and forces himself on her. She submits, but the next day, she reports the crime to her family. The men of her family stand by her side, telling her she has nothing to be ashamed of. She is inconsolable, and ultimately she takes her own life. And Colatinus and the rest of Lucretia's family vowed then and there to drive Tarquinius's family from Rome, and that Rome shall never again have a king. So that was the end of the kings of Rome, and the birth of the famous Roman Republic. The next major turning point in the history of Rome came about 100 years later in 390 BCE, when an army of Gauls swept down the Italian peninsula and attacked the city of Rome. Now, the city had been doing pretty well under the new order. Once it ironed out some basic equal rights laws for its citizens and its ruling class, that is. Things were pretty peaceful. And then, one night, the Roman citizens were awakened by the honking of huge flocks of geese, which had been disturbed by the Gauls. It was only those noisy geese that allowed Rome to organize its defenses in time. Even their guard dogs hadn't heard the Gauls coming, for which the dogs were actually all crucified. You heard us. Anyway... With the successful defense of Rome, the Roman Senate immediately decided to implement a massive military reorganization and reform to make sure Rome would never be under threat again. And they reorganized and reformed their military all the heck over Europe. Yep, that was basically what triggered the expansion of Rome from city to empire. What does any of this have to do with Hades and Orcus and Pluto and Despater, who we haven't even mentioned yet? Well, there's two issues going on with these various gods. The first is that Rome was originally founded by a tribe that mixed Greek and Etruscan ideas pretty heavily, but favored Etruscan. The second is that once Rome went from our first defense as geese to the best defense as a good offense and started conquering pretty much everywhere, they had this practice to help assimilate people into their cosmopolitan culture more easily. The practice was called syncretism. Syncretism is, at its core, the blending of two or more cultural, especially religious, ideas into one hybrid idea. 
It is especially common wherever you have people from different cultural backgrounds living together. Like in the early days of Rome. What happens is that common ideas, say two similar gods, gradually get smooshed together. So if the Etruscans have this god named Orcus who rules the underworld and the dead, and the Greeks have this god named Hades who rules the underworld and the dead, Greek and Etruscans living together generally start to behave as if the two gods are the same god, just with different names. The other form of syncretism happens when one group of people is conquered by another, and the conquerors bring their own religion and culture. Rather than simply try to stamp out the pre-existing religion and culture, which is difficult and oppressive, the pre-existing cultural ideas can be incorporated into the conquerors' ideas. Or vice versa. Over time, the newly blended ideas tend to spread to other areas. So you can have a very amorphous culture that is constantly absorbing new ideas as it reaches new people. And the Romans were masters of syncretism. Part of the reason we don't know now where the Etruscans ended and the Romans began is because when the Romans conquered the Etruscans, they absorbed pretty much everything and made it their own. Same with the Greeks and the various pagan tribes across Europe. And this same thing, by the way, happened as Christianity spread across Europe and incorporated various pagan traditions. Now, meanwhile, the Greeks had this other god who ruled the deepest places of the earth. He was the god of wealth, and he ruled the underground because that's where gold and gems and stuff were found. His name was Pluton, and the Romans had their own version of Pluton, because syncretism. They called him Dis Pater, the father of wealth. At some point, all of these gods, Hades, Pluto, Dis Pater, and Orcus, got jumbled together. And because Roman mythology constantly changed, we can't be quite sure when and how it happened. Eventually, Pluto rose as the god of the underworld, whose name was also the name of the underworld the Roman version of the Greek Hades. And Orcus and Dispater got forgotten. Except not entirely. Both Orcus and Dispater appeared in Dungeons and Dragons. Dispater is an archdevil, one of the rulers of the Nine Hells. And Orcus is remembered three times. At least. Once as Orcus. And the other two times as Ogre and Orc. Yes, you heard us. Ogres and orcs are named after Orcus. As near as we can tell. More specifically, orcs are named after ogres. And ogres are named after Orcus. And that happened because of the traits that Orcus didn't share with Pluto and Hades. Let's start with orcs. Those bestial savages who hate elves. The standard enemy that fantasy heroes fight once they're too powerful to fight any more goblins. Well, orcs were given their names by J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, the Lord of the Rings guy. We hope we don't have to go over that at this point. Well, he named his orcs from an Anglo-Saxon word that was derived from a French word. The word was ogre. Now, French, as anyone can tell, is a romance language. That means it derives a lot of its words from Latin, the language of Rome. And ogre was derived from a Latin word meaning demon. And that word was orco. Which came from... Can you guess? Yes. Orcus. See, Hades, as the ruler of the underworld, wasn't a great guy. And he got up to some awful mischief. But no worse than any of the other Greek gods, really. He just had a job to do. And by all accounts, he was tricked into being the ruler of the underworld by his brothers Zeus and Poseidon during a rigged game of draw straws. Really. But Orcus, the Etruscan god of the underworld, he had a worse reputation. First, he was this gigantic monster. Basically, he was a hairy bearded giant. Second, he was the son of Discordia, who was the Roman equivalent of Eris goddess of strife and chaos. So he had kind of a bad temper. Third, in addition to being the ruler of the underworld, he was also a vengeful deity. His main thing was to enforce oaths and promises 
and to punish those who broke their word. Viciously. Which is what you'd expect from a vicious bearded giant who hung out with corpses all the time and who was born from literal chaos. Now what's interesting is that for a little while, the Romans actually seem to have had two gods of the underworld. One was Dispater or Pluto. He ruled the realm of the dead and he also had a lot of cash. The other was Orcus. And he was basically a demon of brutal punishment. And gradually, Pluto overtook Orcus, and Orcus got forgotten when interest in Roman mythology re-emerged and got combined with Christian ideas in the late Middle Ages. You know, when we got all sorts of classic stuff like Dante's Inferno. Yeah, basically, Orcus got overshadowed by Pluto in a new edition of Roman mythology. Of course, gods like Dispater and Hades and Pluto and Orcus and a lot of other gods are all really easy to mix up anyway, because they are all part of a broad classification of mythological figures known as Chthonic deities. That's C-T-H-O-N-I-C. It's a Greek word. It means related to the underground. And it's the term for deities that rule the underworld. But if that word and spelling sound familiar, that's because that word lent its name to another massive pop culture demon that you might have heard bandied about the fantasy milieu. Perhaps you've heard its call. If not, you'll have to wait until next week to find out what else is waiting buried in the deep darkness underground. Waiting to awaken. <laughs> This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. Thank you.